In this video, I'm going to provide a short overview of a few additional tools that you can use to analyze conflict. I'm going to look at onion diagrams, iceberg diagrams, escalators, and ABC diagrams. Each of these is suited to analyze some specific aspect of a conflict system. As I go through these tools, I'm going to use the conflict between myself and my mother, the one over the invitations for my wedding, that I discussed in the conflict mapping video. Let's start by talking about conflict onions, or onion diagrams. Conflict is like an onion in many ways. There are manifest aspects that are out in the open, and lots of factors that are latent, that are underneath the surface. Often, when we work with conflict, we need to peel back the layers to get at what is underneath. This includes getting underneath the stated positions of the conflict parties. That is, to go beyond what the parties say that they want, so as to identify their deeper goals, interests, and needs. We also need to recognize how our relationships, and the history of those relationships, affects the conflict situations. We've talked about this before in terms of looking at the conflict epicenter. Any diagrams can be helpful, uh, helping us visualize and think through these issues. They are particularly useful for helping you visualize the positions, goals, interests, and needs of different parties. Drawing a conflict diagram is pretty simple. You basically draw three embedded circles. Uh, the first one, you label as positions. The second one, you'd label as interests and goals. And the third one, you label as needs. Generally, you would want to draw one diagram for each of the main conflict parties, so you would usually need to make at least two onions. Once you have drawn your basic template, you can think about uh, Think about the positions, goals, and needs of the parties, and write that information in the corresponding circle. Positions are what the conflict parties explicitly say that they want. So in my example, my mom's position was, the invitations must say presentation. My position was, no. These positions are pretty incompatible. Uh, they're basically the complete opposite of each other. So these positions don't really offer any opportunity for collaborative solutions. Now remember, earlier on in Module 1, I talked about how conflict is often like a game of tug of war. Conflict occurs when there is some kind of blockage between what two or more party, different parties want. This blockage leads to frustration and other intense emotions. Often, however, this blockage isn't as hard to overcome as the parties may assume. This is because the blockage is actually between the positions of the parties. That is what they, it is between what they say they want. If we go deeper, if we look underneath these positions to identify the underlying goals, interests, and needs of the parties, we can open up space for more collaborative, mutually satisfactory solutions. Now, when I'm talking about goals, I'm talking more generally about what the parties are trying to get or achieve. In some cases, this is the same thing as their positions, but sometimes their positions and their goals actually differ. Uh, so you, sometimes you need to kind of get beyond what they're kind of explicitly saying they want and what it is underneath that they're actually looking for. The term interest refers to the various things the parties are concerned about. When I'm talking about needs, I'm referring to basic human needs, such as food and shelter, as well as things like connection, identity, and a sense of purpose. So again, goals are what the parties are trying to get or achieve, interests are all the things the parties are concerned about, and needs are the very basic things that we require in order to be healthy and well. Generally, parties have far more goals, interests, and needs than they do positions. Getting a richer picture of these underlying concerns is often necessary when seeking to adequately address a conflict. Positions often force a conflict into a win-lose framework, while goals, interests, and needs offer more possibilities for mutually satisfactory solutions. So, in my case, the positions held by my mother and I were definitely in a win-lose framework. However, if we go beneath these positions, uh, we can see that my mom and I actually had several shared goals and interests, including uh, getting the invitations out on time, getting invitations that we like, respecting family members, adhering to customs, and for me at least, having the invitations paid for by, by someone else. So as you can probably see, the either-or nature of the positions doesn't really offer enough flexibility for alternative solutions, and again pushes parties into a competitive win-lose orientation. However, working from interests and goals has the potential to be more productive. It promotes a deeper level of understanding and more space for creativity. However, 
Sometimes you need to go even deeper uh, to think about underlying needs. These are even more basic and arguably actually universal. Again, these can include things like ba the basic needs for food and water, as well as identity and connection needs. In this case, respect, connection, and identity were shared needs that both my mother and I were seeking to have filled. Now, when dealing with intractable conflicts, that is, conflicts that are persistently difficult to solve and have taken on a life of their own, it is often necessary to start off by talking about universally shared needs. Uh, this is because the parties involved might not be willing to even consider each other's goals and interests at that time. Working with conflict often involves moving from positions to goals, interests, and needs. Thinking through this using an onion diagram offers a handy way to clarify what these are. Here's one more example. One of my favorite activities to do in classes is to put students into groups of two and then give each group one orange. I then tell them, uh, you and your partner are in conflict over the orange. You both want it. They then have to brainstorm all of the possible resolutions to this conflict. Part of this exercise is to help students distinguish between positions, goals, and needs. Moving beyond the position of, I want the orange, to goals such as, I want to make orange juice, or I want to make an orange cake, and then to underlie, identify the underlying deeper needs such as, I'm hungry, or I'm thirsty. This is an important part of coming up with creative alternatives to conflict. The point is, positions often clash, and we need to get beyond them in order to open up space for more creative solutions. So that's the basics of an onion diagram. You can also push the visualization a bit further by adding two more outer circles. Uh, you can add one uh, to brainstorm relational factors that you think need to be taken into consideration. And then you can add another one to consider the deeper history of the relationship, including, say, past conflicts. So you can use this tool to just focus on needs, goals, uh, interests, and positions, uh, so as to get a better picture of the conflict episode. Or you can expand it a bit further uh, to visualize some aspects of the epicenter. So that's it for the onion. If you would like, take a few moments now to use the tool to visualize some aspects of the conflict that you have experienced. Before moving on to the conflict iceberg, I want to draw your attention to uh, this tool that's sometimes called a conflict triangle or positions and interest mapping. Students in conflict resolution studies may have already seen a model that looks something like this. This tool uses the same basic idea as the onion, only in this case you make two triangles, one for each party. So if I was going to use it, I would probably have one triangle for me and one triangle for my mother. In the top of the triangle, you would write the party's positions. And then, underneath, you would brainstorm everything else that the party is concerned about in the conflict situation. The point of this is to ident identify both different and shared interests, that is, to identify areas of mutual concern. This can provide a starting point for helping the parties think about what they have in common, and what they could build upon to develop more mutually satisfactory ways of dealing with the conflict. Another tool similar to the conflict onion is the conflict iceberg. This also asks us to look at the latent and manifest aspects of the conflict, but this tool is a bit more flexible than the onion because you can use it to think about other aspects of the conflict that need to be considered. The point here is to identify what is out in the open and what is under the surface, and to then use that knowledge to determine what needs to be drawn out into the open. To use an iceberg, draw a triangle with three layers. The top layer would be where you could brainstorm all of the manifest or all of the out of the open, out in the open aspects of the com of conflict. The middle layer would be where you would think about all the aspects of the conflict that are known but unspoken. So here you could list other goals and interests, latent issues of concern, latent behaviors and attitudes, maybe other parties that are impacted and involved in the conflict but who are not really being considered. Basically, you can identify any other factor that you think needs to be considered. The bottom layer is to help you think about uh, other aspects of the conflict that might be at play but that no one has really even thought about or considered. Here you could think about cultural factors, institutional pressures, structural issues, and other things that may be at play but are things that parties may not even be aware of. <laughs> 
Using this, you can develop questions that could help each party in a conflict think about the situation in a more complex way, to identify concerns, pressures, and issues that they may not realize are impacting the way that they and other parties are behaving and thinking. So if I were to use this for my own conflict, I would put the positions held by my mother and I at the top, along with the overt behaviors that we were using to deal with the conflict. In the second level, I would include, for example, other parties, such as my husband, other latent conflicts, and the goals and interests of my mother and I. In the deep level, I would include things like the time pressures we felt, the impact of long-distance communication, and the sense of loss we both felt due to my grandfather's passing. The point of all this is to figure out what you need to be aware of and what you need to bring out into the open as you work with the conflict. Take a moment and play around with this tool if you, if you think it would be relevant to your own example of conflict. Conflict escalation diagrams, or what I like to call conflict escalators, help to visualize how a conflict has escalated and de-escalated over time. Generally, you plot the diagram with two axes. Uh, on the y-axis, you would put the level of escalation. And on the, sorry, on the y-axis, you would put the level of escalation, and on the x-axis, you would put time. By conflict escalation and de-escalation, I'm referring to how harmful behaviors, stressful emotions, and negative perceptions have become more and less intense over time. You can depict how a conflict escalates and de-escalates by showing the pre-confrontation or latent phase of the conflict, that is when the conflict existed but was not out in the open, a major confrontation event, wherein one or both parties brought the conflict out into the open, the escalation and de-escalation of the conflict over time, uh, that is, you show uh, the behaviors and emotions and perceptions becoming more intense and extreme by having the line go up, and you show the behaviors, emotions, and perceptions becoming less intense by having the line go down. You can also identify any kind of crisis point. By this I mean a very intense point in the conflict, often characterized by very harmful behaviors. Crisis points are generally thought to trigger some change in the process of the conflict. That is, the parties come to realize that things can't continue on the way they have, so they can then take action to de-escalate the conflict, or in some cases end the relationship. To use the terminology from systems theory, you could say that this crisis point leads either to system change or system collapse. Sometimes conflict theorists will use the term mutually hurting stalemate to, to describe a crisis point. A mutually hurting stale, stalemate generally occurs when a conflict stagnates, that is, when neither party really has a chance of winning the conflict, but neither party wants to back down either. Eventually, both parties reach a point where they realize the cost of continuing the conflict is too high. They can't win, and they just keep getting hurt. At this point, it is said the conflict is ripe for de-escalation and resolution. At the bottom, you will notice this flat line. Once a conflict has de-escalated, it might be tempting to assume that it has also been resolved, but this isn't necessarily the case. Perhaps the main conflict episode is no longer that heated, but deeper relational issues may remain, which can then lead to more conflict in the future. Or perhaps the conflict has merely been suppressed, and is now waiting to erupt again in the future. Overall, you can see that this diagram is roughly broken down into three phases the latent phase, the escalation uh, and crisis phase, and the resolution phase. In real life, things are not that neat. Uh, an accurate escalator diagram would probably have several peaks and valleys. Uh, it might look something a little more like this. The point of all this is to identify if the conflict is latent or manifest, what has triggered changes in the conflict system, and overall, uh, what causes the conflict to become more or less destructive. This provides guidance for what to do and what not to do in order to handle the conflict in a more constructive way. So let's apply this to my example. Uh, I'm just going to use the template I have here to kind of plot out several key conflict events. But like I said before, draw the escalation and de-escalation lines in whatever way makes the most sense to you and that most accurately uh, represents how the conflict has intensified and uh, de-escalated over time. So let's start off here. Uh, I can identify the point uh, wherein the conflict existed, but was in the latent phase for quite some time. Uh, my mom had mentioned the invitations on a few occasions, at times dropping hints that she wanted them to look a certain way. I disagreed with this, but kept it to myself. 
The conflict manifested as soon as I confronted my mother about this, uh, stating that Kevin and I did not want to write the word presentation on the invitations. This was followed by a series of increasingly heated phone conversations. Uh, this is the escalation of the conflict, so that line going up. I would definitely identify the crisis point of this conflict uh, as one conversation in which my mother actually became very upset and suggested that I was disrespecting her and her culture by my decision uh, to not actually include the word presentation. It was at this point that I figured out figured that another approach was probably necessary, so I temporarily temporarily withdrew from the conflict. Uh, that is, I stopped sort of engaging directly with my mother and brought in the invitation expert. Now, this did lead to uh, a sudden de-escalation of the conflict and uh, a resolution of the particular conflict episode. However, many issues remained because the conflict had negatively impacted uh, the underlying epicenter. Now, that all being said, uh, things could have gotten much worse. I could have chosen to ex escalate the conflict further. Who knows where it could have gone? Now, in some situations, conflicts take on a life of their own. Uh, they spiral out of control, or like this arrow, they go right off the graph. In these situations, the parties become more concerned about each other's behavior, and often become locked in cycles of revenge. Uh, often when we're referring to uh, intractable conflicts, uh, this is sort of the dynamic that these conflicts take on. A term that is sometimes used to describe these situations uh, is meta-conflict. This is a conflict primarily about com conflicting behaviors. Uh, there is generally a root to these types of conflicts, uh, but it has been kind of pushed under the surface, often lost or forgotten. So that is the conflict escalation diagram, or the conflict escalator. Let's move on to an ABC diagram. Now think back to Galton's conflict triangle, which I talked about earlier on in Module 1. Remember, he suggested that a conflict involves the interactions between attitudes, behaviors, and core contradictions, that is, the contradictions between positions and goals. An ABC diagram is basically just this model filled out with information about the conflict. Uh, you would generally make one for each party, discussing their attitudes under A, their behaviors under B, and their main issues of concern under C. To help you out with this one, I'm going to post a printable template on Nexus. Uh, this would be useful if you were working with someone in a conflict situation to help them understand the conflict from both their own perspective and the other party's perspective. You could, however, adapt, adapt this tool to use on yourself. You would normally start by discussing behaviors. Uh, you would ask the person, uh, ask the person about the behavior of the person with whom they are in conflict with, writing that information here. Then you would ask them about what they notice about their own behavior, writing that information here. Then you can talk about attitudes, asking the person to explain how they perceive themselves and the other person. Then you can talk to them about what they see as the core issues and contradictions involved in the conflict. The middle can be used to help the person think about what they and the other person party, the other conflict parties share. Uh, this could be interests, needs, behaviors, you know, whatever the parties have in com common. So this tool is a good one to use when working on a conflict early on, especially with conflicting parties that have very strange relationships. Uh, it's not necessarily the best tool to use on yourself by yourself, uh, so I recommend working through it with another person who can help you think beyond your own perspective. So in summary, I've talked about four main tools here, onions, icebergs, escalators, and ABCs. Regardless of which tool you choose, it is important to remember the entire point of using these tools is to help facilitate thinking processes and conversations. The tool as such is not that important, so you can change them as you see fit. So considering these different tools, which one do you think would be the most helpful for you in your own conflict work?